All right. Um, so some of the questions we had heard during the break, I'll do my best to repeat them. Didn't do a terrible job. Uh, folks asked about this resolution for the new elections equipment that we have out that we'll be providing to everybody in a packet who's um, on the phone or watching online. Um, that is not a requirement to complete. Um, we're just strongly encouraging you all to complete it. And there's not really a timeline associated with it, provided it's done before the election, ideally. So if you've got a meeting coming up in July or early August, that'll be fine. And then we would like that to be sent to us for our record keeping. So that was one of the questions I heard. Um, we had some other questions about Canvas that we'll get at with the calendaring. And I think those were the main questions I had during the break. So um, let's keep moving along. Uh, everybody online is muted again. So if you have questions, you can either use the chat or I will open up the box in just a bit for everybody else. Um, or open up the microphones again in just a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about that new equipment. So we are rolling out four new pieces of equipment for the August primary, and then that'll be used going, actually, it's new to some of you. Uh, the poll pad is returned for some of our cities and town cities. Um, but anyways, we're rolling this out for early voting, in-person voting, and um, will be used for our, all of our elections going forward. The first piece of equipment is the DS200 tabulator. That is our precinct tabulator, and that replaces our M100, if anybody knows of it by that name. It replaces your gray metal boxes with black plastic boxes, which are quite a bit lighter, but still secure. And the tabulator itself is different in the regard that it has a full color display, so people will be able to see very clearly if their vote has been accepted or not. And it'll also be very clear for them what's wrong with their ballot if it needs to be corrected. Um, I mentioned it does take an image of our write-in, so that will clean up our write-in process. You'll actually get a spreadsheet that lists all of the um, ballot numbers and the image of the write-in, and then we can tabulate from there. So that's some pretty good equipment there that we'll be rolling out. Um, it's also going to change our start, our opening of the polls process. Uh, essentially, you are going to plug it in, um, unlock the door, and flip up the screen. Um, and you'll be ready to go. And then at the end of the night, you'll pull out a thumb drive at the very last moment. You need to make sure you do that at the right time. So we're looking forward to that equipment rolling out um, to our polling places. Uh, the other piece of equipment that will be in all of our polling places is called the Omni Ballot. That is replacing our AutoMark. The AutoMark was our assisted voting device. So this is assisted voting device as well. Um, what it does is it allows the voter to read here and or mark their ballot, and it allows for the independent voting experience that we're required to provide to all of our voters across the country. Um, the device also has a, the functionality of, of um, printing ballots on demand, so it becomes our insurance policy if we would happen to run out of ballots. Um, and then the other thing that we're really excited about by it is it has a QR sc code scanning functionality. So we can use that in our early voting process to make sure people are voting the right ballots, which becomes a little bit of a problem. We have hundreds of people running through our office. It gets a little crazy, and sometimes that ballot might get, um, they might get handed the wrong jurisdictional ballot. If we have people using the Omni ballot, they will be forced to write the, vote the right ballot because we can associate it with their profile instead. So a lot of technical details there that we won't get into, uh, but we're really uh, looking forward to that being of assistance in the early voting process. There is a separate printer that goes along with that and some uh, connections that will have to be made. So there will be instructions. And that's one of the devices we really are thinking <coughs> of and want to see in advance. So we do have it set up downstairs if anybody's interested. All of this equipment is uh, required by state law to be available for inspection and um, investigation by any voters. So we have publicly announced that. You posting that notice will help us with that as well. And so that's why it's available if somebody would want to actually see it, touch it, and um, understand how it works. We're obligated to share that with them. We kind of enjoy doing it because we're excited by the equipment too. So if you want to stop down, let us know, um, or we can do it afterwards. The DS450 is a central comp tabulator. This guy is going to help us out immensely with all of the early voting that we have and all of our mail ballots. Um, it processes them in bulk. Um, it allows us to do multiple precincts. Um, one after another to tabulate results on an ongoing or cumulative basis. Really good piece of equipment that'll help us out. And then the pull pad, um, everybody's favorite is the pull pad or it becomes your favorite once you've used it. Um, and those will be used in all jurisdictions that are voting live now. So all of our small cities and townships will be doing them after Lake Crystal and Eagle Lake violated them. 
in 2018 for us. In the small cities, we'll be rolling those out everywhere. We had made that decision early on, um, but it's actually going to be very, very helpful for us in regards to COVID uh, because it does change um, our interactions with the voter there. It's going to spit out a receipt for them to sign, which can then be more easily touched and put away rather than having that roster go back and forth and have pages flipped repeatedly. You no longer have a roster to flip. You get to touch a screen, a button on the screen um, and that stays with the election judge. So much more sanitary for us to use uh, in response to our current environment. So lots of training on that. Yes. Mike, you the chat and get Oh, all right. Um, all right, very good. Okay, so we do have a question here from Terry. Um, can anyone request curbside voting for any reason? Um, and can you please review the process when using a poll pad? Awesome questions. I am going to save that for when we talk about curbside voting, which is coming up in a slide or two or five. So we'll get to that one, Terry. If I don't, uh, be sure to raise your hand again and we'll get it covered. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'm excited about the poll pads and curbside voting, but I, so I'll save it. Um, Additional information on the equipment. Um, in case folks have any concern at all related to the, the equipment, feel free to pass them along to me or Christy directly. Um, consider passing the resolution as we've talked about. Just to let you know, the equipment um, has been certified at the federal and state levels. It goes through rigorous testing um, in order to be used in the state of Minnesota as well as in the United States. Um, we also are required to test and validate it at the county level to make sure it's working with our election specifically. Uh, we did purchase from all U.S.-based companies, and all of our equipment still relies on human-readable paper backups. So whether or not it's a ballot that has ovals filled in it, um, or it is a full pad receipt that is printed out, it is all paper-based backup. There is also extensive audit logs associated with all of these to the minute detail of uh, recording what button is pushed when. So there's very extensive um, security built into all of those systems that we'll be using. And I've already mentioned that it is available for inspection for anybody who'd like to see it. Facts for you to be aware of, we're starting with August. Uh, so they will be rolled out for this election. The actual pickup and return of equipment will be very similar. So you're the proud owners of a black plastic ballot box that you'll get to keep. <laughs> um, and then the actual tabulator itself will be things that those pieces will be being returned to us as they have been in the past. Okay. Um, we will be collecting those gray metal boxes uh, from you. If you have some reason to keep that, if you're attached to it or would like it for some reason, um, we would gladly offer that up to you um, <laughs> for the cost of a candidate filing fee of $2. Um, but otherwise, we'll be collecting those. They are going to get uh, scrapped out and surplus out. Um, the equipment is all purchased with our uh, technology fees and state grant dollars, uh, so there's no additional costs that are coming your way. Um, and we'll continue to use those pieces of equipment as long as we can. And then, as I said, we will be doing as much training via video and recordings as we possibly can. Slight problem uh, with that is some of this equipment you just don't learn without touching it, so we'll be doing some of those sessions in a much smaller size. Um, doing it more of kind of an open house form where you'll walk around and be able to test it on your own time. So, okay. Um, so let's move on to training that, unless I have any questions about equipment. Okay. So, like, oh, yes. Yeah. Unless the grades change from the last time, like you're talking about. Uh, yeah, the big gray metal bin is the ballot bin. Uh, it's on wheels, so that is no longer going to be used. That was built specifically for the old tabulators. The new ones are different. So yeah, so those are what we're collecting back. If you want to return those, um, give our office a call. We'll let you know where to drop them off. We're doing it as kind of just a drop off service and then we'll have staff uh, bring them in from, from, from the drop off area. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, election judge training then. Uh, so the election judge training um, is going to match the process that we've used in the past as much as possible. However, we just clearly are not going to be able to rely on in-person training as much as we once were. There are some instances where we're going to have to do something like this again because the information is just too critical to not share this way. This is how we'll do our head judge capstone, so that additional hour of training that we provide for our head judges will need to be in this sort of setting. We just can't rely on an internet connection to make sure folks have that important information. But what we'll do is we'll try to do as much online as possible um, so folks can view it safely from home. 
Uh, if you want to coordinate any sort of in-person viewing of that sort of stuff at a local office or something like that, feel free for your judges. You're responsible for hiring them and whatnot. You would just need to make sure that you're getting their certifications all marked in forms and whatnot. So what I mean by that is they'll all get logins to watch videos, for example. But if you have them all come in on the same day, you can load that video and have them watch it with you if that's easier. We just would have to know to give them credit for that class if they don't submit it themselves online. Okay. As I said, some in-person will be required. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, we need to make sure we have all of your judges. Uh, if you're not in the city of Mankato and you're a live polling place, so if we don't have all your judges, let us know. Um, we'll share that information, information with you. The reason we need that info is that we need to get them the online portals. In the past, we didn't need that because they could have just come and done the in-person options for that training, but unfortunately we don't have that luxury this year, so we're going to have to get them online to some extent. Um, one thing to pay attention to, we have heard from some folks, is that um, the email sometimes gets marked as spam. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to send out an email from me or from Christy or Becky Elections to let you know that training has been released and that the emails have gone out. But ultimately, you'll want to make sure your judges know to watch for emails and maybe safe uh, list emails that are coming from moduselections.com. It'll have my name, it'll have Christy's name, or it'll have Beck Elections on it, but it'll say at Modus Elections instead of at Blue Earth County. So just make sure folks are aware of that. And if anybody is questioning why they aren't getting training or notices like that, let us know because um, we'll deal with that. Um, try to help them out. Training should go out sometime next week is our, our hope. Our problem with it all needing to be online is that it all has to be ready at once rather than being able to stage it. So that's a lot of training that we have to get prepared. Um, but we'll get there. We always find a way. I already talked about that for your clerk, uh, city, town, and school district clerk, elections clerk training. Um, if you're brand new to the elections process, you need to get five hours for this certification period, which will run for the next two years. Um, if you've been experienced as an elections clerk, you only need four hours. This course is going to cover two of those hours. If you are a, a if you go through the election judge training, if you come in for our equipment training, those can all help you get to your additional hours. So we'll have you covered for training as long as you uh, follow along in the plan. For our school district clerks, if you haven't signed up to be an election judge but want to be included in that training to get all your hours, you should submit a request to be an election judge. That way you'll just be in that pool. Um, and then if you work, awesome. If you don't, um, we just won't assign you to work in the election. Okay. Otherwise, find, you can also find your own training. It doesn't have to be from us. Yes, Lori. So since I'm mail ballot and I wasn't planning to be an election judge, do I need more hours or are my two still enough today enough? Well, you'll still need to get to four because you're still an elections clerk. Right. So then what you'll want to do is either find training from the township. Sometimes they do elections eligible training. Or you can, much like I just said with the school district, you could sign up because then that way you could do the online rules and regs introduction. That'll get you another hour of training. And then maybe you sit through the equipment background just so you understand more about the equipment. Like You can use our training to get you to your four hours but you don't have to. The only class you must do is this two hour clerk training. You can find your other hours on your own. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's jump a little bit into the courses there. So our training program for 2020 um, has this clerk course, 120 minutes long. It's orangish red because it's an in-person class and only offered in person. Um, the blue classes are all available online. So the clerk training is separate. We're going to complete that today. Then we start our election judge program. The election judge program is broken down into roles. There's the head judge role, the election judge role, and the health care judge role. The health care judge role is going to be 70 minutes of online training. That is for our health care facility folks so that they can help those uh, folks in nursing homes and hospitals. Uh, the election judge program is going to be um, several different courses. There's an introductory session that just welcomes people to the election judge world. Ten minutes long. We spend 70 minutes on rules and processes. We have two different courses on equipment. One is 30 minutes long, and that's going to just introduce the equipment, let people know where things plug in, and that sort of stuff. And then the additional 40 minutes is going to be more in detail of how to use the equipment. 
split that up so it's not too long and it also makes that more digestible after the fact. If you need to just understand how to set it up, you can watch a shorter video than if you're trying to troubleshoot something. Um, and then we have another in-person session, that's a capstone session. That is where we're going to allow people to test the equipment, play with the equipment. And so right now that one is going to be considered optional, but highly recommended. Um, highly recommended for anybody who wants to get a better understanding of the equipment, uh, but really through the equipment online training will cover that. It'll also be an opportunity for folks to ask questions. So um, we're going to encourage it, but we can't re we're probably not going to require it. The head judge is going to be an election judge and then also take a 60 minute in person class <laughs> where we just do a review of everything that's important and talk about managing the polling place, especially in light of COVID. Okay, so that is our plan and it'll all get released um, and rolled out um, as quickly as we can um, with the plan of uh, getting these courses online so folks can start digesting it when it works for them. Okay, questions about all about training? So let's roll into, um, I want to talk just a little about mail balloting because it is so new for some of our folks here. Um, so mail balloting is the same concept as absentee balloting. It's just a little different in its process. Uh, mail ballot is a jurisdiction's choice. The township or the city gets to decide that provided the population isn't too big for some of our cities. Um, whereas absentee voting is done completely by the voters, uh, irregardless of what's happening in that jurisdiction. Mail balloting is also jurisdiction wide, so every registered voter is going to be treated the same way in a mail ballot precinct. What they're going to be, how they're going to be treated is they're going to receive a ballot, um, and then that ballot can be voted from uh, their home whenever it's convenient for them, provided that they get it returned to us uh, in time to be counted. Um, some of the other things to note is that if you have a non-registered voter in your mail ballot precinct, we don't know about them, so we can't send them a ballot. So then it relies on the townships, the cities, neighbors, housemates to let that person know that they need to register so that we can automatically mail on the ballot. Or if they don't register in time, they vote through the absentee ballot process so that they can prove their eligibility on their own. Okay. Um, we also use a statewide system to manage both of these processes, and I, that's important for me to note because people oftentimes think that, oh, if I vote by mail ballot, what's preventing me from going and voting somewhere else again and, and trying to vote twice? That statewide system is linked to you and you're identifying information, so you're not going to be able to re-register and have that vote count again or even vote through the process again if you've already been issued a ballot in a mail ballot process that has already been accepted or has not been spoiled out of the system. Okay. Also just informational for you, the mail ballot process ends up costing about $3 per voter, whereas the absentee process costs us about $5 per voter. Um, so while we are still encouraging everyone to vote from home because it's safer for us right now, um, the mail balloting process is a more cost effective alternative to that. Uh, you can see a map there of what we have going on. Uh, we have seven new mail ballot townships uh, in, the, in 2020 here and in 2018. That brings us up to a total of 26 jurisdictions that vote by mail ballot. I have six cities that aren't eligible because their populations are too large. And then we have four townships that are still alive. So right now we're sitting at uh, 26 jurisdictions that vote by mail. Um, and we have a total of 10 jurisdictions that vote live on election day. Okay. Uh, this 26 uh, jurisdictions result in about 6,700 ballots being mailed out automatically. That's the number of registered voters out of about 36,000, 37,000 registered voters countywide. So that is ticking up there for us. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about election security, if we may. Uh, what I want to talk about with election security is. Um, Four main areas. We talked a little bit about just the integrity of the election on election night and some of our processes in advance, but we want you also to be thinking about election in terms of fraud and what you can do to help. And what we mean by that is making sure um, that we keep our systems secure, that you're not sharing your passwords, uh, not doing anything like that, uh, that might impact our systems. So where you can help us out the most with that is with email security and making sure that you're not clicking through on links or forwarding links to us that you haven't validated or know what's up. 
be completely honest with you, if we get a forwarded email from you or an email that doesn't feel right, we're not opening it. Um, they're getting quarantined and separated out. And we'll likely call you on it first, but just try to help us out in that regard because we've really got to try to keep our voter database safe, which lives on our side of the systems. The other thing related to fraud is oftentimes that's where your voter questions are going to come from. Folks are going to have concerns about fraud in the election. The best thing we can do there is try to answer those questions rather than ignore them. So if you need help with that, let us know, pass those calls along to us, and we'll take care of that for you. Um, a lot of our, our current threats uh, that we're being made aware of, and just for your information, we do get made aware of those. We are part of multiple groups at the state and federal level uh, where we get threat assessments uh, regularly to us. Um, and so what we're seeing a lot of our concern right now is tied to email. That's why I brought that up and uh, password security. So the county has implemented multi-factor checks on a lot of our election systems. Um, actually, I think every system that we're using is requiring us to multi-factor or identify ourselves in two manners before we can log into it now. The other thing that we do a lot of is what's called trust and verify. So while I might trust the email coming from Ava, I'm still gonna verify that it should be safe to open. And that's just a good way to think about things is that you may trust that person, but you still need to verify uh, that actual source, right? Uh, that is similar to what we talk about when we talk about election rigging. Election rigging is also called electioneering. Um, and so that would be when somebody makes a claim, maybe in a Facebook post or something like that, that people are stuffing the ballot boxes or harvesting ballots or uh, the latest that we saw in the news is that uh, the results are being messed with in I think was it Louisiana or somewhere, that the results were delayed so long that they think people are changing the numbers to make the results match what they want. That all goes in the rigging category. Um, and what we encourage folks to do in responding to that is always have people check their sources. Is oftentimes that claim of rigging an election or election viewing is coming from a source that isn't something that should be uh, trusted or validated. We use that same trust and verify concept there. And where we really can use the help with electioneering or election rigging is any sort of irregularities. So for example, like Kathy shared with me that she sent out absentee ballot applications to all of her residents. Uh, that's a really good piece of information for us to know because now when Christy and her team starts processing those, if Christy says, wait a minute, why do we have all these new St. Clair ones? We know that that irregularity is explainable because there was a voter outreach there rather than me having to worry about something going on there. Um, same sorts of things happen when the state gets involved with voter outreach and things like that. It's good for us to know that in advance. So helping us get in front of those irregularities so that we can plan around them is good. The other thing that we always do is we encourage people to ask questions. So the minute somebody tells us that they think the election is rigged, we ask them why. Help us understand why you think that's the case so that we can explain that. Because just about everything in the election world has an answer to why we do it and a double check and a second um, review, things like that to help us secure that election. Okay. The thing that we forget because we get all scared about cyber and all these other things is that we still have to physically take care of ourselves. We have to do that in response to COVID obviously, but we also have to do it just in terms of uh, elections are now operating in a different environment, right? Good or bad or indifferent, more and more folks are exercising their first to right, First Amendment right to express their opinions. And sometimes that gets heated and it gets brought into the polling place or into our public forums, right? And so we want to make sure that we know our resources that are available to us to protect ourselves on election day. Those resources are 911. We tell that all the time. The election judges are free to call 911 if that's necessary. Um, but I can also share with you that we work with the sheriff's office and with local police departments to make sure they know where our polling places are and that they have staff available, deputies available to respond more quickly. That's something you might wanna have with your uh, local officers as well, just to not have them impose themselves, but to be nearby uh, to help to respond to any issues. And then of course, be aware of those issues. If something is heating up in your community, um, any uh, conversations are getting a little bit more elevated than they might need to be, uh, those are things for you to be aware of to let us know so that we can help you plan around those, okay? Any questions related to that? Uh, just a good reminder there, this is a nice little box. Um, uh, you can always explain to people how you're keeping the election uh, integrity intact. And think about that in terms of universal access. We want to make sure that everybody who has the eligibility and right to vote can express that activity if they choose to. And we want to do that in an 
clinically equitable fashion. So we're not choosing a party to help more or less. Uh, we're not judging somebody's uh, character by the party they support. Um, we're going to treat them universally equal. Uh, and then we also are going to be ethical in our actions, professional in our actions, impartial and transparent, explaining what we're doing, following processes and whatnot. Okay. Any questions at all on that? All right, so as I mentioned, um, the calendar is provided in the slides. We'll get that to everybody at home as well. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the dates because really you can read them as well as I can. Um, what we've done is we've broken it down by month and by day, and then I've bolded the tasks that are more important for you to be aware of, whereas the other ones are more generally uh, important to the elections process. Um, the most important dates there for you is to make sure that uh, you publish your notice of election August 4th. If uh, you have a requirement to do that, and then also know that we'll be getting materials to you no later than August 7th for the August 11th primary. Your filing period um, closes on August 11th as well, um, so be aware of that date and be ready to be open for that date. Um, I actually jumped a slide on you, didn't I? I'm sorry. You, you see your June dates there. I'm like, why am I not talking June and July for you? Apologize for that. So let me back up, start over. So we've got some of those dates in July, posting the election July 27th. Um, we want to make sure that we have that ready to roll and the filing period starts July 28th. Um, one thing that some folks do miss is getting your election judges appointed. That would be a resolution to pass. That's July 17th. If you don't have all of your election judges known at that time, you can pass the list based on who you do know, and then just add a disclaimer that you can appoint judges in an emergency situation. That'll cover your basis there. That only applies for our live uh, jurisdictions, precincts uh, that operate on election day. Here's my August dates for me. I apologize for that. I already covered those for you. Uh, just remember to stay open for late filing until 5 p.m. on August 11th. Figure out how you're going to work through that if you're a live polling place um, and are operating a polling place on the same day. And then we get some dates after the election. Like I said, we'll start proofing those ballots very soon after the election occurs, uh, August 11th. And then uh, you technically have to notify us of your election by August 21st. So make sure you've got that on your calendar as well. As we move into September, we get a little bit of a reprieve with things going on in September, but nothing uh, super urgent on your behalf. Uh, and then we get into the same sort of schedule for the November election that we had for our requirements there. Getting election judges appointed, publishing notices and sample ballots, um, getting materials from our office, and then we obviously get to the election. Uh, remember uh, that in order to give somebody an election certificate and show that they're the winner, they have to have that candidate of their certificate of campaign finance filing completed. Um, so I reminded you of that date. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we're collecting any sort of campaign financial reports if they're due in December and then designating your polling place by December 31st. So like I said, I planned on running through those dates very quickly, so I will answer any questions if you have them. Folks at home, I'll get you a list of all of those dates and the materials. Um, and use this as kind of your cheat sheet, but remember to use the elections calendar to see everything that's important, okay? Questions at all about any of those processes? Okay, so let's talk COVID. Like I said, I saved COVID for the very end because this is really only gonna impact our live precincts, um, and we're gonna cover the same sort of material throughout all of our training. Um, so we will talk COVID probably more than anybody cares to talk COVID at this point in time. In our, in our operations. The first thing I need to say about this is that we are seeing changes daily in terms of uh, what the best practices and guidances are uh, related to COVID, um, as well as just responses to hotspots and any sorts of flare-ups of um, cases. So the information that's being included is the, the best information we have, but it's really gonna rely on election day information that we're gonna be providing in the polling place, right? Um, we do have four really good resources. Um, three of them are all based online. Um, the EAC, which is the Election Administration uh, Committee, is a federal group uh, that has provided some guidelines. Um, that link is available. Um, the CDC has guidelines specifically to operating your polling place. And so the, in the, the Department of Health at the state of Minnesota 
has information that's more general to like uh, community events, gatherings of people. And what uh, MDH has is really good signage. So if you're looking at stealing some signs, uh, that's a good resource. The state of Minnesota will be providing some signs for you to incorporate. Um, I've seen them, they're not great. So we're gonna be adding our own on top of that um, just to try to get some messaging apart or better. Um, the current guidance says that personal protective measures are our best defense, washing hands, covering coughs. So we're gonna make sure folks remember to do that. Staying home when sick, so having judges in your back pocket in case you have absences uh, would be something good to do. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer is our best approach to keeping hands clean if we can't wash them. The reason I say that is because gloves are not gonna be provided. Uh, the CDC and the state say that gloves are effective but um, lead people to cross-contaminate because they get a false sense of security because they're wearing gloves. But the minute you touch a, con a contaminated screen, put your hand in a pocket, uh, rub your face, nose, eyes, you've now contaminated that glove. So unless you're switching that glove nonstop, it's not any better than sanitizing your hands. So we'd rather have you squirt sanitizer and keep that process going and wear gloves. Um, face coverings are recommended. They're recommended if six foot social distancing or a protective barrier is not available. I mentioned early on in our presentation, I don't know what our final guidance is gonna be in terms of requiring masks for voters. As of right now, they are only strongly recommended. And so they will be provided for the polling places at about an 8% level for expected voters. Because we expect people will bring their own masks or they'll, there'll be a small subset of folks that will need one. Um, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to work through um, the process for somebody who refuses to wear a mask. And what that looks like right now is that we're gonna help them vote in a different manner, that we can ensure safety and security. So that might be curbside voting, it might be having them vote in a different area of the building or something like that. But ultimately right now, we're not able to refuse them the right to vote in the polling place if they refuse to wear a mask. We're gonna just have to work around that. That again is current guidance that could change um, depending on any state, local, or federal mandates to wear masks. So that's a stay tuned, uh, be prepared for it. Be ready to clean. Um, cleaning protocols are in place in terms of sanitizing voting booths. Um, we're gonna reduce shared objects. So you are going to get an awful lot of pens um, which we're going to try to provide so that they can be sterilized in batches. I shouldn't say sterilized, sanitized in batches, um, or at least left to sit so that they can, um, so that the germs of uh, life uh, can expire before they're reused. We are gonna try to use alternative voting options, the vote from home option, the curbside voting. Here's where I can answer your question, Terry, about curbside voting. Uh, curbside voting is available for anybody who feels that they cannot enter the polling place. So that does not mean you have to be handicapped. If somebody requests to vote from their car because they don't feel like they can enter the polling place, we don't get to question that reason. We have to provide them curbside voting. The way that curbside voting is going to work with the poll pad is that um, for this election, we are going to allow a poll pad to go to the car to check in that voter. And, um, and then what will, that'll allow us to do is to bring the ballot out to them with their receipt so that that can reduce the number of trips. Under the normal curbside process for all of our new clerks, you would go out and greet the voter, have them fill out a form so that you can bring the form back into the office so that you can then go out back out there with the ballot and then recollect that ballot. We're trying to reduce some of our backs and forths with that. So stay tuned on more directions on that, but we are hoping to get the poll pad uh, worked into that process for us as we expect curbside voting to uh, tick up a little bit. We're also going to need to work through guidance on what to do with the voter who um, is experiencing symptoms. Current understanding with that is that we can restrict their access to the polling place, but not restrict their ability to vote. So that would likely involve masks and protective gear and probably doing that from a curbside or other environment for that voter. Uh, we also want you to think about your polling place a little bit and your traffic flow. If there's any way to keep one-way traffic like the grocery stores have attempted to do, we'd encourage that. Uh, that's why we moved many of our polling places in Mankato so that we have larger hallways, longer hallways to cue people and the ability to bring people in and out of doors without it being a congestion point. So things like that to be thinking about. 
Um, the CDC polling place guidelines go into detail about that, so that's a really good resource for you. Other things to think about is just how election day is going to change for you. You now are likely going to have a judge who's going to be wiping down booths, right? And what does that look like and how do you work that into your schedule? Um, we've got a couple of other things that we can talk about in terms of the materials that we're going to be providing that'll work into that. So, okay. Questions about, um, questions about uh, COVID in general? Okay. I see one came in online. I'll grab that in just a second. Um, but let's talk about the equipment that's being provided. So I talked about that dollar amount, and I'm guessing you were probably underwhelmed by that amount of money. Um, and part of that was because a lot of this is going to be provided in kind in terms of supplies. Those dollars are more specific to something that's unique to your polling place. Uh, the Secretary of State is going to be providing what's considered essential materials. And what that means is that um, it'll be distributed from us at the county level to you. And it's going to be masks. Masks for election judges are going to be provided, and they're going to be provided at a higher quality grade. Um, so they are N95, but not medical grade N95, meaning that the packaging is going to be slightly less secure than otherwise. But it's a good quality filtering mask that will be provided. Um, and then there'll be more of the generic masks that are available for voters. So that's provided on election day uh, for you. Disinfectant spray uh, and towels will be provided and hand sanitizer will be provided in the spray pump option. Um, that'll be available across the polling places and distributed from the state to you. We also have access through our community or our county emergency operations center for additional masks if we find that we don't think we have enough of them. Uh, we also have hand sanitizer available there if we would need it. So we do have plans for that. That'll be provided. The county is going to use its portion of the CARES Act funding um, and additional federal CARES Act funding to provide supplemental materials, materials that I think will be helpful on Election Day. Um, these will be provided as requested because I don't want to make assumptions to how you're going to operate your live polling places. Um, so what we are going to do is provide, um, make available to you these face shields and hats. So I know it looks a little weird, but what is nice about these is these actually pack flat. And so we, and they're a little bit less intimidating and heavy and hot compared to some of those more surgical grade ones. They essentially will slide on the bill of a hat. Yes, we did make the hats orange. We did that so that the election worker would stand out in home places. Um, it slides on the bill of the hat, little flaps tick under there, and then it does provide the barrier for our election judges um, on election day. Okay. So it's actually pretty lightweight, and what this would do is this would allow you to not wear a mask, because if you have a protective barrier on your face, you don't have to have a mask on. The reason we went this route instead of go the plexiglass standard barriers is our election judges don't sit still. You're running to a ballot bin, you're running to help a voter in a booth, you're answering a question at the door. So we felt that bringing the plexiglass to the judge was better than trying to get plexiglass thrown also significantly cheaper than the cost of plexiglass, if you've looked at that at all. So we will make these available to our live election day polling places if it's something that you'd like to do. Uh, we can also help you out with signs to help advertise curbside voting better. Uh, we have a bunch of just these blank yard signs. So if you have your own messaging you want to put on there, we can help you out with that. Otherwise, this is what we're using. Obviously, we wouldn't have our phone number on there. Um, we would have something local for you. And then the other thing that we're going to do is um, provide you with social distancing stickers. Um, that went well. Um, these we have bought in bulk, so if that's what you want to use on election day, feel free to ask us for those. Um, they go on for they're repositionable, removable. And then what we've also done is we have bought a fair number of these cardboard boxes. And they lay flat on election day. You can fold them up and put them together. If you're just looking for some sorts of like actual barriers to make your polling place a little bit more um, organized, um, to put signs on them, sanitizer, whatever might make sense for you on election day, it just kind of gives you the ability to try to cue things a little bit better. Um, so these are boxes that we made available as just an easier way to get those out there. So that's the supplemental materials uh, that we're providing. In addition to disposable items, uh, pens will be provided. We are going to try to collect them and clean them um, so we don't have to go through quite as many of them. We obviously can't use ballot secrecy folders anymore because um, you can't really wash a cardboard 
manila folder. Um, so what we've actually come up with is some uh, butcher butcher wrap paper. And if we do two sheets of those and fold them in half, they, they secure a ballot, keep it private, and those can be recycled um, into a recycling bin rather than try to be washed or cleaned. So it's unfortunately a little bit more disposable with things like that. And of course, if there are other items that you think would be helpful, you either can use your supplementary funds or let us know and we can try to help with that. That is what I have there. Um, the follow-up questions to the poll pad um, process and curbside voting. Um, will the receipt print if you're outside with the poll pad? It will if you're within a certain distance of it. So that's why we want to make sure we set up that correctly. Um, it has some uh, Bluetooth connectivity to read out there. Otherwise, when you get back in, you would be able to hit the reprint on that button once you check that voter. So Terry will explain that more in the actual training with the poll pads, um, but that poll pad will work for curbside voting. So. Any other questions related to COVID or anything in general? Yes. With the signage, since we're going to the mail and ballot, we wanted to make up a sign for outside to say, yep. is there a specific wording that you want for the sign? Um, Tell people to go to, we, to you. We, and, we could help you all with that. I think okay. Garden City was the most recent that switched over. And so I think she's got a sign that she put on her door. Okay. We can, otherwise we can help you all with that. Cause yeah, you'll want to direct them if you're Mail, vote, mail voters on election day will come to our office um, to vote if they want to vote. Any other questions? I'm going to open up the online uh, chat if anybody wants to ask a question there. Otherwise, anything else in the room? Sure. Yes, Carrie. Well, those stay safe six foot stickers, do they work on carpet? Uh, so the question was, do the six, uh, the stay safe, the six foot social distancing stickers, they do work, they're repositionable. Um, so they're actually a really high quality vinyl based sticker. But yeah, on carpet, they'll pull up and, and be repositionable quite well. Um, they won't be reusable. So like if you want to pull them up between the August election, you can't reuse them in November, unfortunately, but we'll just get you some more. Yeah. All right, um, any other questions? Yes. Not seeing any, hearing any, so I think we are done. We're going to call it a day, everyone. I just have one more. All right, go ahead, Karen. Yeah. So when we set up our polling place, so now we're going to have to get our voting booths six feet apart as well, correct? Yep. So, so the can we set them like back to back? And yep. So the question is, the voting booths do they need to be six foot apart? So CDC guidelines say yes, everything should be six foot apart. But remember, if you can't maintain social distancing, then masks or other protective barriers are recommended, right? So you can make that decision. If your polling place isn't going to allow for that, then maybe masks are going to be more strongly recommended. And then you're going to deal with the person who refuses to wear a mask and figure out how that works. Um, because yes, booths being six foot apart are going to be a challenge, especially in November. And then you also have to balance that with this. So what are you achieving? Because if you're going to have people queuing in line anyways, or walking around in a polling place, you've already lost your six foot social distance. So having your booths be apart isn't going to help you because you're already going to be requiring masks or recommending masks, right? So things like that to think about. Where you want to really think about your polling place planning is those early points of contact where you don't have control. So where are you going to queue people if they are trying to wait six foot apart? Do you have a nice long hallway? How do you keep that one doorway from being uh, two-way traffic? Is there a way to do that? Those are the more easy changes that you can make. And then the booster, you're going to have to work through the best you can and likely just clean them more frequently. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we have made it to the end. Like I said, we will get the materials uh, from today's class available either on our website or emailed out, probably on our website, just so it's accessible for everybody anytime. And then we will also communicate additional information on, on the future training. So, all right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.